We have another 2.5D platformer on the way as we cover Nintendo Power Magazine issue 104 for January of 1998. Our cover game this issue is Yoshi's Story for the N64, another 2.5D platformer after Mischief Makers earlier. Getting this this early in the Nintendo 64's life cycle, along with another Mario Kart, kind of surprises me considering how far in the Super Nintendo's life cycle that Yoshi's Island and Mario Kart were. In the letters column, we have a bunch of letters about GoldenEye 007, this issue, and a piece of envelope art that shows that even if Nintendo has pushed their RPG legacy to the side, the fans still remember. In the power charts, we have a bunch of new titles entering the chart for the Nintendo 64, including Quarterback Club 98, San Francisco Rush, Extreme G, and Bomberman 64. Donkey Kong Land 3 also enters the charts on the Game Boy. We get to our cover game very quickly with coverage of Yoshi's Story. We get an official mention that of, again, 2.5D to refer to this variety of platformer, three-dimensional characters um, moving on a two-dimensional plane. The article discusses the game's arts and crafts aesthetic. That is, arts and crafts is in what you did back in grade school with um, crayons and pastels and that sort of thing, not arts and crafts in terms of the architectural style. There's also discussion of how Yoshi's moves haven't changed much since the first game. What appears to be the big difference here is there is no baby Mario to save. So the focus here is instead on exploration and the collection of secrets on the way to the end of the level, with a unlocking additional levels being determined by the number of hidden hearts that you can find on the various stages, about three per stage. Now, the game is going to come out in the U.S. in March, but as of this issue, it's already out in Japan, so let's take a look at it now. Yoshi's story plays incredibly well, with a real style and flair that takes the sort of uh, crayon and pencil sketch style from Yoshi's Island and gives it more of a pastel art flair. It really sets the idea of the Yoshi's games being the ones that experiment visually with aesthetics that are honestly different from most other platformers, especially the Mario games, until we get into stuff like Kirby's Epic Yarn with the Wii. Further, they pull this off in a 2.5D game with polygonal characters playing like 2D sprites, and the visual display works incredibly well, as opposed to the issues I had with visual clutter and control issues with Mischief Makers. This really shows that indeed the N64 can do 2D platformers very well. It's not just a 3D platformer system. And that, honestly, um, there is, like, uh, and the Nintendo still has it as well. Something that we will see going forward as their handheld consoles grow to greater prominence, such as with the Game Boy Advance. The Monday Night Wars are in full effect, and they have carried over to consoles as well with the first of Aki's wrestling games, WCW vs. NWO World Tour. We have notes on the various gameplay modes of the game, along with some of the game's mechanics. We also have notes on the moves of several of the various wrestlers on the roster, and it bears mentioning at this point that Scott Steiner is not yet Big Papa Pump, and we are in the middle of the fake Sting storyline, with a fake Sting apparently being part of the NWO. There's also some notes on the quote-unquote off-brand wrestlers who are mainly Japanese wrestlers like Masahiro Chono um, with different names. WCW vs. NWO World Tour is a game where, if you are familiar with modern wrestling games, even the SmackDown series, you can probably just pick up this game and play it without necessarily looking at the manual much and with a general familiarity with the game's mechanics. Aki laid the groundwork for what Yukes and so many other developers making wrestling games for decades to come would build on. Because so many more successful wrestling games of this generation and ones that came after took cues from this. In a way, it means this game has aged incredibly well from a control standpoint. Not because so many games changed on what this did, but rather so many games recognized what this game is doing right and just added on to that while keeping that foundation. The thing that leads to this game feeling dated is not how it plays, but how it's presented. 
There are no entrances in this game. There is no form of narrative in this game, no story mode to string together the matches, no simulated promos or backstage segments like we get with the SmackDown series, and there is no create a wrestler mode, as we would see innovate with the WWF wrestling games and so forth. Next is Snowboard Kids, a snowboarding game from Atlas with some more cartoony character designs. So we have notes on the gameplay modes and a few of the characters, plus maps of some of the courses. Snowboard Kids tries to take the Mario Kart approach for a extreme sport snowboarding racing game. The problem is with the nuts and bolts of how you do a lap, because it's lap based as opposed to just a single run. We, in order to complete a lap, you not only have to reach the end, but you also have to reach the entrance to the ski lift. There's a very small hot zone to get to, and only one character can activate it at a time. And this is without getting into the fact that designers of this have failed to realize that Mario Kart uses rubber banding algorithms to handle what power-ups are given out when, leading to that serving as a way to help whoever's in last place get up at least to like, you know, the winner's circle. And instead what happens is you get a very brutal battle often over third place or even second place, never mind trying to take first. Now, from some research, I've heard that there is a sequel and hopefully it improves on some of the little things that make this game not quite work. We have some information from Nintendo on their Space World Expo for 1997, where they put a big focus on the N64 uh, disk drive and on Pokemon. In particular, we get a look at the Mario Artist suite of tools, plus a discussion of a couple of Pokemon games that they're considering N64 disk drive integration for, particularly Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon Snap. In the classified information column, we get a trick for GoldenEye 007, where in the multiplayer live and let die mode, if you shoot the ammo boxes, they'll multiply. Next up is another N64 puzzle game, Wet Tricks, which appears to be trying to be 3D Tetris, but with water. Wet Tricks is, unfortunately, nowhere near intuitive as Tetris is. I, I get the general concept, and the fluid dynamics tech is really impressive with how, with how it handles the flowing of water, but the actual execution of the concept is just clunky enough that it doesn't actually work, and it doesn't promote the sort of meditative play that makes for a good puzzle game, like Tetris, like Panel kind of Pawn, like Columns, that sort of thing. I'm with modern puzzle games, like with Bejeweled. So, I, I appreciate this for what they're trying to do, but it just doesn't work and accomplish the goals that they're aiming for. We have some more coverage of Duke Nukem 64, which I've already covered a couple episodes ago, so moving on. We also have more coverage of Diddy Kong Racing with shortcuts of the various tracks. Again, I've reviewed this. Moving on. We have another Jeopardy game, this time on the N64, and there really isn't a lot to say about these games because they're, they're trivia games, and in the case of ones like this, they're trivia games based on a game show and fitting the format of that game show, an existing TV game show, so it doesn't have necessarily the style and flair or even speak that much to the times in terms of its presentation, the way that something like You Don't Know Jack or like if we had a video game version of win Ben Stein's money, what that would do. Instead, it's the only thing that makes it stand out from earlier versions of the game is just the question selection. So I'm giving it a miss. We have another 3D fighting game for the Nintendo 64 with Fighter's Destiny. We have some notes on the gameplay modes and the characters. It looks more grounded than some of the other games we've had so far, but I don't know how much character it has. Fighter's Destiny is interesting. Based a lot on the scoring system, you get points on how you win a round. Um, in the sense of knocking them down, knocking them out of the ring, that sort of thing. Um, and if you can throw opponents, 
get points for that too, which ultimately basically leads to most of the matches being won by points and often being won by doing the throw. Now, this design decision is interesting, and it is one that is radically different from what everyone else is doing, but it's not necessarily a good thing. It doesn't necessarily work as well from a play standpoint as like Tekken and Virtual Fighter. There's a reason why those games didn't do this, why they tended to hew closer to basically taking cues from Street Fighter or King of Fighters or that sort of thing, but expanding the scope to a three-dimensional arena. So I appreciate, again, what they're doing here, but they're not succeeding ultimately their goal in terms of making a fun and rewarding fighting game in this respect. We haven't had a Game Boy game in a while, and next up is our first Game Boy game of the issue with Turok Battle of the Bionosaurs, a run-and-gun platformer for the Game Boy. We get notes and maps for the full game. Turok Battle of the Bionosaurs almost plays well, but runs into problems with having the kind of large and expansive levels that play well with exploration on a console game, especially on the S Super Nintendo, like with, for example, Super Turrican, but which doesn't work as well on a handheld where everything tends to run a little better in smaller bite-sized chunks, as I've discussed repeatedly in the past when it comes to the controls are otherwise fine. Weapon selection could be more intuitive, but otherwise it's alright. And the jumping is very precise, though it could be a little better, but I like the ability to mantle. That said, again, weapon and switching isn't completely intuitive, aiming is rough, and the enemies aren't stunned when they take damage means that before you get ranged weapons, you are 100% going to get hit from fighting opponents, because you will land your first attack, and then immediately take damage as the enemy runs through your character's spray. And then when you do get ranged weapons, you're still going to get hit, because the enemies will be moving fast enough, you will get once again shot off before the enemy runs into you, and then you'll waste a bunch of shots while you try to line up the attack. And you can't just quickly switch to melee, because you have the, well, restr control restrictions of being on the Game Boy. We get some more strategies for Star Fox 64 in Counselor's Corner. We now have another puzzle platformer on the Game Boy with the Fidgets, with two Ts. We have notes on the two characters you control and the early stages of the game. The Fidgets should have been a more restrained take on the Lost Viking, the two characters instead of three, which would fit wonderfully on a handheld system like the Game Boy with less button inputs than the Lost Vikings would have had access to on the Super Nintendo. The thing is, though, many of the Lost Viking levels don't have time limits, which gives the player time to explore and experiment and figure out how the level's puzzles are supposed to work. By contrast, the Fidgets has a very tight time limit, which doesn't give a lot of room for, well, again, exploration and experimentation, which is the bread and butter of a puzzle platform. It's a puzzle game that doesn't give you time to work on the actual puzzle part, which just plain stinks. It makes for a, like, it might be great from a speedrunning standpoint, but on the other hand, it also doesn't make me that perspective, doesn't give you much room for developing your speedrunning tech either, because it's all about beating the levels anyway. So by the time you've beaten the level, you've already figured out mostly how to speedrun. Moving on, our last game of the issue and our last Game Boy game, well, is The Lost World Jurassic Park, a platformer based on the movie. Again, very extensive maps of the game. Well, the Lost World Jurassic Park for the Game Boy has convinced me there is no such thing as a good Jurassic Park game. At least, until we get to the park management sims in the present day. The movement of the characters are just too slippery here, the attack animation is too unresponsive, aiming your weapon at the dinosaurs is too clunky with no lock-on or form of eight-way aim. In short, 
That is one big pile of shit. No also rands in the now playing column this issue. In Pack Watch, we have new trade dress. Also, we have a look at uh, 1080 snowboarding and a whole bunch of new Game Boy games as well. It looks like we're getting new life for the system in anticipation of the upcoming release of uh, Pokemon. With the games here, including Castlevania Legends and Dragon Quest Monsters. My pick for this issue is a pretty clear cut one. Yoshi's Story is not just one of the strongest games in this issue, but one of the strongest games in the N64's library period. It is a clear demonstration of the fact that the N64 can do a standard 2D platformer and do it tremendously well. It shows that Nintendo still got it when it comes to doing, well, 2D platformer gameplay, which is going to come up again when we start getting more into handhelds as the, well, Game Boy and later the Game Boy Advance rises to prominence and we start seeing platformers getting, particularly older platforms, getting re-released on that system. I'm going to put um, WCW vs. NWO World Tour in here as our multiplayer pick. We haven't done one of those in a while. Um... But this is, like, Aki's wrestling games really hold up well as a fun game to play among friends. And the fact that the N64 supports four-player out of the gate because it has four multiplayer ports on it um, works even better with this. And this will, we'll see going forward on Nintendo platforms, while we'll still have good, solid one-on-one -on -one fighting games, um, like the... GameCube port of uh, Soul Calibur, of, Soul part of the uh, Soul Calibur games that come out, that will also see people really taking advantage of the fact that you can do a solid four-player fighting game and have it be manageable and everyone be able to have fun. And I think, honestly, with the games we've seen featured so far, in a way, Aki and the WCW um, wrestling games, and later on with their... WWF wrestling games will start laying the groundwork for people to look at them and go, oh, we can do good four player action in this set, in this arrangement. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.